represent Michael Vogel. My name is Hassan and I'm an organizer with No One Is Illegal Toronto and the End Immigration Detention Network. My name is Max Scott. I work with No One Is Illegal Toronto and I'm an employee of the Carenza LLP law firm as an immigration consultant. I'm here to talk to you about numbers. 54 million is the amount that Canada spends every year to lock immigrants in detention. That's the amount we spend to put people in jail for the purposes of removing them from Canada. $239 is the amount that you and I as taxpayers spend every day to put someone in jail to remove them from Canada. Again, they haven't committed a crime, or if they have, they've served their time. 191 is the number of men who went on hunger strike and went on strike because they said enough is enough. You either need to remove us or you need to release us. 13.9, that's the likelihood of winning a detention review. That's the hearing you go to to decide if you're going to be released when you're detained as an immigrant detainee. Two, we have a two-tiered justice system in Canada. We have a justice system for citizens. If I break the law, I get a trial. I may get held until trial, but at trial they decide if I've done something wrong and how long I should be held. At the end of being held, I'm released. Not so for immigrant detainees. They're held as long as we want. They're held indefinitely. There's no trial. And if there is a hearing to decide if they're removed from Canada, they're presumed guilty until they can prove themselves innocent. At the detention reviews, as I said, there's a 13.9% chance that they'll be released, and it goes down each time they have a review. They will review every 30 days, but the longer they're held, the less likely that the board member will release them. One, I have one client. His name is Michael Movogo. Mr. Movogo is currently detained at Lindsay, not because of a criminal offense. He is on immigration hold, and Canada is unable to deport him to his home country, uh, Cameroon. Mr. Mugogo has been in detention for over seven years, and CBSA, until now, is unable to get a travel document so he can be deported to Cameroon. His um, detention has become indefinite not only because of the length of time that he's been in jail, but also because there is no clear timeline as to when the travel document can be issued to him. Indefinite detention clearly violates his charter rights as well as the UN criteria regarding arbitrary detention. Michael Movogo is one of 191 prisoners, migrants locked up in maximum security prison in Lindsay Jail, who are taking action since September 16th against their detention. Detainees have refused food, they have refused to go to their detention hearings, and they've refused to go back into their cells. In the face of coercion and violence, these detainees are taking courageous action against immigration detention. And for this resistance, a number of detainees have been locked up in solitary and in segregation where they are very sick. Thousands of people have signed petitions, taken action, visited MP offices and called supporting the migrant strike demands and indefinite detention and make maximum security lockups, improve prison conditions. You can too. Join us. tell you guys a little bit about Forza Forza, just so y'all know. Um, we began in 2008 after there was a series of raids in Leamington, Ontario. Um, so Forza, Forza basically means strength or courage in Spanish and Tagalog because the majority of the people that we work with speak Spanish or Tagalog. So uh, we actually usually specifically work with migrant workers. Um, so that's basically people who are coming on um, a work permit through programs such as the SALT program, which is the Seasonal Agricultural Workers program, the Low Skilled Pilot Project, and the Le Living Caregiver program. So every year there's a series of raids, um, and basically what happens is that through these raids people get repatriated. Um, and I know it's, it gets complicated, like what's the difference between a refugee and the difference between a migrant worker, and for you guys, I did my grade elementary school skills, and I made some... Uh, some charts, and I'm gonna go, uh, not right now, They're, I'll go into them a little bit later, but they kind of show like all the categories. So these are all the categories under permanent residence. These are all the categories as, oops, wrong. This, these are all the categories as a permanent residence, same one. These are all the categories as a temporary status migrant, so come, someone who's coming under a permit. And then these are all the categories for non-status. Um, and it gets, oops, it gets kind of complicated with designated foreign national. I don't know if you talked about that. 
but kind of alongside with Bill C-31, which is a very notorious bill that introduced all kinds of really ridiculous things, um, they introduced this concept of designated foreign national, and that'll kind of come into play with the some of the immigration detainees that are in Lindsay. Um, and so in making this, um, it's kind of important, and in doing migrant justice work, to see how complicated this stuff really is. And the Canadian government has really done a good job in making so many different ca classifications for individuals coming into Canada and has created such a hierarchy that it is really hard to do this work. Because just in listening to Michael, Michael? Mm -hmm. yeah. Just in listening to Michael, every case is context specific. Even if you're coming as a refugee, are you privately sponsored? Are you publicly sponsored? Are you coming from a designated country of origin or not a designated country of origin? It gets really complicated and through almost every single one of those categories, you can be made illegal. So I can go into that later if you guys want. I'm gonna focus on these folks in Lindsay, but before all that, I do primarily migrant justice work, so people who are coming as temporary foreign workers. Um, I've been doing this work for maybe four years um, and plan on doing this work for the next little while. Like you were saying, we organize health clinics um, and health fairs just because on the whole health-based side, these individuals get screwed over really hard also, and I could spend days talking just about health, but today we're going to be talking about prison. Um, <laughs> so. Um, Basically, through this work, I've partnered up, our organization has partnered up with tons of organizations, with UFCW, with different health clinics, with No One Is Illegal, with Muslicia. So we've made a lot of friends in this work because you can't do it all. It's better to just focus on one, one aspect and just focus on that because if not, it's just, it becomes too big. Um, unfortunately, First Press actually does focus on all of them and that's why we don't have very good capacity for this. But, Anyway, so we teamed up with No One Is Illegal for a, a lot of events in the past. Um, and basically, um, in terms of, of what's going on in Lindsay, Ontario right now, uh, we were co-organizing an event called Running Down the Walls. Has anybody heard of Running Down the Walls? Yeah. Basically, it's, a, in, a, it's uh, in its history, is an anarchist event. Um, and so every year, people, different anarchist chapters and different cities will raise money for political prisoners. They say political, but lately it's starting to shift away from political and just raising money for, for long-term prisoners. Um, so there were some people from Fresa Perza who were organizing uh, for this event in Hamilton. And we received a call uh, that people were starting to strike um, in this detention center in Lindsay. So kind of what happened, and I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a timeline, uh, is that, um, so in Lindsay, there have always been immigration detainees in Lindsay, but there have never been this many. So as you might have touched on, they're scattered all over. Basically, you're only held in uh, a detention, an actual immigration holding center for maybe a few weeks, and then you're switched to a, a provincial jail. Um, and in many cases, you're held in maximum security prisons. Um, and so a lot of these folks were actually being held in Maplehurst, uh, which is in Milton. They were being held in the Don, and they were being held in the Toronto West, so a bunch of different facilities. Um, and then basically what happened is that on August 20th, oh, and some people weren't even in jail, actually. Some people were outside of jail. Um, and on August 20th, uh, they took a bunch of people without notice, didn't tell them that they were going to move them, and they're like, okay, we're taking you guys over to Lindsay. Uh, some people who were um, permanent residents who had been convicted of prior crimes as a permanent resident uh, went into, okay, so basically how it works is that um, when you're a permanent resident, uh, if you've been convicted of a crime, in some cases, depending on the severity of that crime, they'll order a, what's called a removal order. Uh, once you're given that removal order, so essentially to be removed uh, or deportation notice, you have to sign in with CBSA. And sometimes they're making you sign in every day. So I've spoken to a lot of people who have lived in Canada for several years, uh, some people up to a decade as permanent residents, convicted or were convicted of some sort of crime, served their crime, so already spent time in jail, and then were signing in with CBSA um, and one day they went to go sign in, and CBSA said, well, you failed to comply. 
Basically what it means to fail to comply is that you missed a meeting at some point or another. All of these individuals swear that they didn't miss a meeting. So that, that's one half of the people who are at Lindsay. The rest of them were in uh, detention already. Um, some of them were in detention because they were designated foreign nationals. Uh, so basically what it means when you're a designated foreign national is that the government of Canada calls these people, they, they get put in that category if they've come as an irregular arrival. Um, and basically that means that they don't have papers uh, and that the government believes that they were smuggled. Uh, and so this gets really weird because that whole word smuggling is so broad. Like the majority of folks that I know, I'm from El Salvador. So the majority of folks that I know who are coming from El Salvador, they're using coyotes. That's what you use, right? And so if, when you can't get papers, it's really difficult to get papers in El Salvador on that end. When you, get, when you can't get papers, that's what you're gonna use. But if you arrive to Canada, you're now deemed as des a designated foreign national and they automatically detain you for two weeks. If they can't identify you within that two weeks, they will detain you for six months. And then after that six months, they might detain you for six more months. That's the other category of individuals. And then there's the individuals who came as refugee claimants and were failed. They call them failed claimants. And basically that means they either just didn't get their appeal in on time or the government of Canada decided that you know they weren't going to be granted refugee status and they didn't leave. There's all kinds of reasons. Um, so these individuals were either taken from, from prisons in Ontario or they went to sign in and then they were arrested on the spot. Uh, the individual who actually um, was gonna come in today, really awesome lady named Latoya, her husband, she went with her husband to sign in. He got asked to be brought into a room and she was just sitting outside the room. She just thought that they needed to have a private conversation. They literally arrested him right there and then took him away. She, had, she actually burst into the room. She's like, what are you doing <laughs> to my husband? And they were like, he failed to comply. So we're arresting him. Um, and so, and, and throughout all this and throughout all of Michael's cases, it gets so murky as to the reasons. Um, and it, it is really easy under this system to become illegal. Even with the, the recent laws and changes in Bill C-31, uh, before, when you were a permanent resident, that's the highest, well, the highest of the hierarchy is citizenship. If you got citizenship, you know, if you get convicted of a crime, you're gonna serve your crime, and the prison industrial complex is so complicated and really messed up also, but <laughs> that's how they deal with you, and then you get it. Now, if you're a permanent resident, if you leave the country, say someone gets, is ill in your home country, um, or you have to go to a wedding, or for whatever reason, if the government wants to, they have the power to take away your permanent residency. If the country that you're coming from all of a sudden is like, hey, we're a democracy now and everything's great here, the government of Canada can send you back. So the permanent residency status is losing a lot of its status, pretty much, in the hierarchy. So that's something to, to consider when you, when you think of what's going on in these changes. And these are supposedly the people who have the most rights in the hierarchy of immigrants. So anyways, I'm gonna side rant a lot, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, that's kinda how I operate. So uh, I try to be organized, but then it never comes out that way. So anyways, <laughs> I'm gonna give you all a timeline of what happened in Lindsay. Uh, so they all got moved to Lindsay, and they're like, this sucks, you know? Like, at least when we were in Toronto, we were close to our lawyers, we were close, most of them are from Toronto. We're close to our families, people who are really sick. There are some people who have lung cancer that I've spoken to. Some people have cysts in their head. They were close to hospitals. Now they're way out in Lindsay, Ontario, which is right by Peterborough. It's not close to very much, right? They, they can't talk to their lawyers all the time. Their families have to drive now two hours and a half to go visit them. And because they're now in a maximum security prison, they don't get the same programming. So like you were talking about, there's no programming for them. Before, you know, some people were working uh, prison jobs, which also actually just got a wage cut. Um, so people are protesting there. Uh, but uh, they, they don't have those opportunities to work. There's no programming for them. The, the once library is now a cart. A lot of things have changed. So they're, And then the guards in that facility went on strike also. So like the conditions are crap 
if the guards went on strike, so now we have even less things, let's go on strike. Like, this really sucks. So when they first went on strike, it was on September 17th, which was a Tuesday. Um, I know on the video it says September 16th, but from my knowledge, from when I had uh, started talking to immigration and detainees, it was September 17th, and they went on strike for conditions. They, the conditions were that uh, they weren't getting any programming, uh, they weren't getting adequate food, they were actually getting different food from the rest of the inmate population. Their food was rotting, they weren't getting meat, ever. Uh, they had no social worker, they still don't have a social worker by the way, uh, and they weren't able to make any calls. So their calls kept dropping. Even, uh, I an answer the trap line, so basically people call me, can call me from prison and I take their collect calls, and their calls just drop all the time. I'll pick up the phone, they say hey, and the call will drop. And they couldn't make international calls. So these are folks, who, uh, some of them are, are recent immigrants, right? Their families live in different countries and they can't even call them to tell them that they're in jail. It's not a good situation. So they went on strike for that. Um, and then some of them started talking. So the first strike was they refused to go back into their cells um, when the guard said it was time to go back in their cells. They did that for one day. Um, and there was 191 of them. I'd also like to note that this is the largest strike in the history of Canada of undocumented people inside immigration detention. This has never happened before. And the reason why it happened was because <laughs> the government took all three of these groups of people who were in three different detention centers, or they're not detention centers, <coughs> they're jails, uh, and placed them all into one facility. So all of a sudden you have six ranges of individuals who are all there under immigration detention. And they're all looking at each other being like, oh man, we're all in the same situation. We should work together and try, try to get something out of this, try to get some attention. So the Big thing to remember, biggest strike of undocumented people in the history of Canada documented inside of a provincial jail. Uh, so they refused to go in their cells. Then they decided uh, so the, the guards didn't respond. So they're like, you know what? Uh, they had heard of uh, John and Ter Bhuvani, who were in, at that time were in Egypt. Like, these guys are going in jail, and they're going on hunger strike, and they're getting a lot of attention. We're in Canada, why don't we go on hunger strike? And we'll see how much attention we get. So they did a one day hunger strike. They didn't get any attention. That was when we, when we were contacted. Someone contacted us and we're like, hey, there's, there's 191 people who are on hunger strike inside of Canada, two hours away. You don't have to look, like, it's not happening all the way in Egypt. Don't get me wrong, that's really important and I'm so happy that they're out. But they're like, there's 191 of them right here on hunger strike. And so we, we started, we set up a trap line and we, we started to get, to started talking to them. And then they stopped. They, they got freaked out and they're like, no, we're, we did this one day hunger strike. That's it. And they got, they actually, through that hunger strike, they got a better canteen. That was one of the things they were asking for. So they had a small success. And then they started talking and they're like, it's not just the conditions that suck. We shouldn't even be in immigration detention in the first place. What are we doing here? We are in indefinite detention. So basically what indefinite detention, just to clarify, because some folks think that it means forever, it doesn't mean forever. It means that you have no idea when you're going to get out. So basically if you're serving a regular crime, when you get sentenced, people are like, all right, you're serving three years, you're serving five years, you're serving whatever years. When people are held in immigration detention, it's not a criminal offense. It falls under administrative law. And I'm not a lawyer or anything fancy to do with law, so I can't go into what that means, <laughs> unfortunately. But basically, um, you're not being held for crime when you're in immigration detention. But they are not even telling you how long you're going to be held for. So you are, in essence, being held indefinitely. You have no idea when you're going to get out. Some of these people, such as uh, Michael Mbogo, who actually just today um, filed a complaint with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees because he's been held for seven years in indefinite immigration detention. No idea when he's going to get out. No idea if they're going to send him back to Iraq or, or sorry, he's from Cameroon. If they're going to send him back from Cameroon or if they're going to let him out in Canada. He's just sitting in limbo for seven years. It's a long time. Um, some of these people have only been in since the point they got arrested. So it really ranges. I think the longest case is eight years. 
and the shortest is since August 20th. But so they all started talking. They're like, what? Yeah, like, especially the folks who just got in, they're like, we could be held here for eight years? Like some of the guys, they're having babies in a few months. A lot of them have kids who have citizenship in Canada. They have wives, they have mamas, they have like dads in this country. They're like, we can't, we're not gonna get home for Christmas. Like one of them is like, my car got impounded. That was his only, his only crime. And he's like, I'm sitting in immigration detention because my car got impounded and I'm a permanent resident. So they got together and they're like, this sucks. So they're like, we're gonna do a bigger hunger strike. And they all, they, they took a piece of paper and they started passing the paper around. And so they all agreed, six ranges, which is a lot of people, you know, to agree to do this hunger strike. And that hunger strike lasted two weeks. Um, which is a long time. Uh, and that was two weeks that everybody stayed on the hunger strike. After that, people, you know, some people have health issues. They started dropping off. Um, some people didn't see it going anywhere. It started dropping off. Some people didn't want it to affect their hearings. Um, but yeah, so it went for two weeks. Uh, and then after that, folks started doing different things to try to get attention. Because reality, we have got some media attention, and we're working really hard to get media attention. No One is Illegal in Toronto is a very organized group, and they have lots of networking connections. And the thing was is that no one wanted to pick up our story. No one. Because they're not Canadian citizens. And so I, I'm on the phone. I talked to the most racist reporters you could ever talk to who are like, well, were they a citizen? No, but you don't understand they're a permanent resident. Mm, well, you know, we need to keep this story local. Like, do they, you know, do they have any family members? You know, their family members are really afraid. Well, mm, no, nah, I don't think I can cover it. <clears throat> Meanwhile, there's other folks who are getting huge coverage. But these folks, 191 people in this country who are being held are getting, no, not, not to say we, we have gotten lots of coverage, but we're getting very, very little coverage to this day. So that's why they started dropping off. Um, so, but they're still, they, at that point, they had changed their demands. So basically, um, their demands went from prison, prison conditions to actually tackling the immigration system. Um, and basically what they're saying is that they want an end to indefinite detention. It's not okay. And actually, Canada is in contravention of many of their own charter rights. Um, I can cite the numbers, but I can't actually cite the charter Sorry. rights, unfortunately. 2, 5, and 17, whatever those are. My memory is really poor. Um, but they're in convention of a lot of charter rights. They don't want to be held in maximum security. There's no need for that. As uh, Michael was saying, they're flight risks. They're, they've already served their charge. They shouldn't be on max. Um, and the other thing is that they want more access to, to legal aid, to lawyers and that they be brought closer to their lawyers and to their families. Uh, because lawyers are expensive. A lot of these folks have spent up to like $20,000 in lawyer fees, and they're still sitting in jail, right? And so a lot of these things that they're asking for are pretty reasonable, you know? Why be held on max? They could be held in, in minimum security prison, at the very least, where they can get programming, where they can work a job, where they're not on lockdown. 24-7. Um, in terms of the indefinite detention, Canada is one of the only countries in the industrialized world that does not have a presumptive period. Basically, what a presumptive period means is a policy that determines how long you can keep someone in immigration detention. So in countries like the UK and the US, the presumptive period is 90 days. So if they can't figure out what to do with you in 90 days, they have to release you. That is the law. If your country won't take you, because some countries, um, it's very hard to, once they're deemed a flight risk or a danger to the public, which is the two biggest reasons why uh, people will be put into immigration detention, um, your countries don't want to take you. They're like, you're a danger to the public. Why do I want you? I'll just keep you in immigration detention. Um, so that's why they, they're held in limbo. So in these other countries, if it's 90 days, they just have to release them. They have to figure out something to do with them. Here in Canada, we just don't have a law. None. We don't have any days. That's why we can hold them for as long as we do. Um, and what the government says is that, well, 
we have a det detention hearing process. So basically, every 30 days, uh, an immigration detainee can go in for a review. Every 30 days, they go in and they talk to a CBSA official um, if they're going to be let out or not. And that's what they say is, well, well, we don't need that policy. We have this detention review and people can make their case and if they make a really good case and they can get out. But we actually did a, a Freedom for Information Act request and we found out that only 13.9% of all detention review people are ever successful. That's a really low percentage. That means that, what, 90? What's the 86. 86.1. Yeah, 86.1% yeah. okay. don't get out, right? Um, and basically what happens, I think, Michael, you mentioned that, is after the first detention review, the longer you spend in jail, the less likely it is going to be that your detention review will be successful. So if you've been in there for five years, some people just boycott it. They stop going to their detention reviews. They're like, why? Why would I go? nothing's gonna happen to me. I'm gonna go, they're gonna say I'm a flight risk, I'm gonna go back to myself. So that was another way that they started uh, uh, boycotting, or started striking. During this time, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees actually went to Lindsay, Ontario. Uh, so there are, there are enough people who are hearing about this that the United Nations was like, okay, I should go visit these people and see what's going on. And basically they said that <clears throat> they know it's a problem, but the conservative, it's the conservative government and they're passing all kinds of laws and they're probably not going to back down on these laws and so that's basically it. They're working on it. So meanwhile these people are still in the same situation. So this past Monday, uh, two individuals got super fed up. Uh, their names are, well I think that's these lock out. Their names are Nosakai Asumbar and Azuka Abagbadi, um, two really, really nice men um, from Nigeria. And they decided enough is enough. They've both only been held till August 20th. One of them has a baby on the way. Um, the other one has several children and really wants to be home before Christmas. <laughs> and they decided they were gonna go on hunger strike again. So on Monday, October 14th, they resumed their hunger strike. Um, and they were immediately put into segregation. So that's another aspect of, um, and this is just uh, talking about striking, what striking look, looks like in prison. When you strike in prison, it's not like you go on hunger strike and everyone inside is supporting you. Prison guards are mean. CBSA officials are mean. They are not your friends. And so when you start striking in prison, certain things start happening. The ICE unit starts coming out. And in prison language, it's called the goon squad. Um, they, they come out in full gear and they start to intimidate you. And so in this case, when the first, and this is why a lot of people have not joined the second hunger strike, because there is another hunger strike that's happening right now, the one that started on October 14th, is that the, the goon squad, or ICE unit, is going to each cell and being like, are you gonna eat? If you don't eat, something bad's gonna happen to you. We're gonna stick you in the hole. We're gonna put you in segregation. If you don't eat, we're not gonna release you. You're gonna stay. You know, the, the warden and uh, the minister for public safety, they don't say that when they make their statements. They made one statement about the hunger strike, and they said that they had heard that one person was hunger striking, which is not true, because I at least have spoken to at least 23 individuals who I know were hunger striking for sure, and we have made visits. Um, they don't talk about how that's going on, you know, how people are being paid to intimidate these people into eating. During their hunger strike, they were on almost 24 hour lockdown. So basically that means that you can't leave your cell, you don't get your book program, you don't get to go anywhere. Your food gets brought to you, and they weren't eating anyway, so it didn't matter if their food was getting brought to them. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of really crappy things that were going on during this hunger strike, and they still maintain. And this happens, it doesn't matter if they're immigration detainees or not. This is the history of, of prison striking in prisons. They always have to respond really harshly. Um, so anyways, they, they were scared. So after the first hunger strike, they're like, oh gosh, I don't, I don't know. Should we go on another hunger strike? It really sucked the last time. Um, but there were two individuals who were like, we're going to, to start hunger striking again. And so they did start hunger striking again. They were immediately put into segregation the next day. And they've been in segregation ever since. And they actually found other people 
who had been put into segregation, who had been hunger striking for 28 days. So there are now people who are on their 30th day that they've been hunger striking to be released. Um, and so it's intense. And there are intense reasons. People don't hunger strike for 30 days because they're illegals or they're criminal convicts. Because when we post this stuff online, th these are the responses they get. Well, they're illegals. We should send them home. You know, Canadians, uh, why are our tax money being spent on these people? Which, number one, unless you're indigenous to this country, I don't think you're allowed to say those things. Because <laughs> I don't know if folks saw what's going on in New Brunswick right now. Indigenous folks are putting up a hard struggle just to be able to, you know, res have respect to their land. So don't go that route because you're not going to get very far. Secondly, a lot of these people are being held for ridiculous reasons. It is very easy to become illegal in this country, to have your status taken away from you. And it is very context specific. You know, there are individuals who did commit crimes. Yes, we're going to say that. They did commit crimes. But they served their crime already. So it's basically a double sentence. There are individuals who um, came as, as permanent residents and, um, you know, CBSA called the check up on them and they weren't home. And someone said they didn't live there. But in a lot of those cases, that person didn't speak English very well and maybe uh, didn't understand what they were saying. There are some situations where it has to do with spouses. So one, one of the ways, I didn't really explain my charts. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> but one of the ways that you can come uh, is that you can get sponsored by, by a spouse, but you have to stay with your spouse for 20 years. Or 20 years, that's such a lot. <laughs> Two years. Um, and, you know, that creates a real big power dynamic, right? Because if you, you and your spouse are not doing that great, you know, and your spouse calls the cops on you, or you leave that person because you have to leave that person, you're illegal now. And you can be arrested. So there are tons of ways, you know, um, that, that you can become illegal. And a lot of these people are very, very wrong. And in terms of the designated foreign nationals, it's really important to think um, about, you know, what I think a lot about, um, just in, in thinking about my own background, uh, is the involvement that Canada has in a lot of these countries. Um, and so when you look at, you know, Canada's involvement in the trade industry in Mexico, the way it's fueling that drug war through NAFTA. You know, there are a lot of Mexicans who are resistant in NAFTA, and now those Mexicans have to come here because they don't have jobs. You know, if you look like countries, uh, Latin American countries, even if you look at Afghanistan and the role that Canada has taken part in Afghanistan, and now there's people who are coming here as refugees because we've got to mess things up in those countries, and then they're like, all right, we're going to stick you in jail because you didn't follow our rules, even though our rules are pretty arbitrary. Um, so it, it's really ridiculous <laughs> what, what's kind of going on in this situation. So what we're asking for, basically, and, and what the immigration detainees are asking for is at the very least, they're not even asking that they all be released because that would just be crazy. The government would never, we all know that the government would never do that. They would never just release all 90, 191. Actually, the number has decreased because there are people who are getting deported every day, unfortunately. Um, but. What they're asking for is that, at the very least, if they are in jail, don't hold them in max. There's no reason to be holding them in max. Have them close to their families, you know, or, or their lawyers. Ha have them in a facility that is not way up north. Um, extend legal aid for these people, because a lot of these people don't have the money. You know, some of these families are recent immigrants. It costs a lot of money to immigrate. Um, so don't, you know, don't be charging them these, well, they're not charging them, but they're having to pay thousands of dollars in, in legal fees. And set up this, uh, this presumptive period so that people cannot be held for more than 90 days. Because being held for more than 90 days is just, it's, it's a human rights abuse, right? Um, and the, the United Nations uh, recommendation on indefinite detention has said that it is human rights abuse. You cannot keep people indefinitely. Um, and even when you do look at, it's important to look at who they're detaining, because it's very specific. They're not detaining a bunch of white folks from Europe. They're detaining people of color who are coming from marginalized countries. These people, the majority of people are from Nigeria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq. 
Mexico, Iran. They're coming from very marginalized countries and it is very specific who is being targeted in immigration law. Um, and I think that's something that's really important to remember when we look at the history of kind of colonization on this land as to who is being detained in this country and who is not being detained. If you look at, if I were to show you on my charts, there are a lot more opportunities for people to come to this country and gain permanent residency um, if you're coming from a, a European country, if you have high skilled work, you can become a permanent resident. But as soon as you're coming from a more marginalized country, it becomes a lot more difficult to gain permanent residency. It becomes a lot more difficult to becoming as a high skilled uh, worker. And so it's it, even uh, on October 23rd, I don't know if y'all know this, but Canada, oh, October 23rd is today. today. Oh, today. <laughs> They're actually introducing a, a new biometrics law. And so they do have this in, in a lot of other law, in a lot of other countries. Uh, but they're introducing what biometrics means is that you have to give your fingerprints um, when you enter the country. And so uh, countries now, certain countries, let me be specific, are now going to have to fingerprint as soon as they come into the country. And once again, if you look at the countries that have to be fingerprinting, it's Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, you know, the Congo, Nigeria, almost every single country in, every single country in the Middle East, almost every single country in Africa, and almost every single country in Central America and South America. So once again, it is very specific. And yeah, it, it kind of, um, and just, just to also think about like the fact that people haven't been covering these stories because they see them, what happens when you start to see certain people as illegals and certain people as convicts and who these people have, what it reinforces and why these people don't get as, as much attention as other individuals. It's very scary <laughs> situation. Um, and I, I've been put in an awkward position because I'm uh, even, I forgot to mention, if I get a phone call, I have to leave because, and I haven't gotten any phone calls, thank goodness, uh, because I have the trap line in my name um, so detainees will call me and I'll, I will give them updates and they'll give me updates and sometimes we do recordings and stuff. But I get put in a really awkward position uh, because a lot of detainees at this point, it's been almost a month and a half, no, it's a month and a week since they started their strikes. And they're like, we don't understand. Like, why, why aren't we in the news? Why aren't people paying attention to us? Why, someone specifically was like, why is John and Tarek in the news all the time and we are? I don't get it. And they're really angry about it. They don't understand that Canada, the country of immigrants and multiculturalism and all that crap, how they could not be paying attention to people who are being held in these conditions. Um, and it really raises a lot of questions. And even if you look at, at where the immigration system is going, as, you were, as Michael was saying, even in the last, in 2013, They've already settled 50% less refugees than they resettled in 2012. And in 2012, it was the second lowest number since the 1980s. So Canada can't even say. And then in 2011, the, um, at uh, some convention in Switzerland, uh, it's like those big conventions where the really powerful countries meet up. The Geneva Convention, I saw you not it yet. At the Geneva Convention, uh, Canada said that they were going to the biggest amount of refugees ever and they were going to make our system really great and stop the backlogging and all this stuff. But then the following year, second lowest number since the 1980s. Now in 2013, 50% less than the year before. And now people who are inside these countries are detaining them and putting them in, into jails. And then you know the other half, which is actually the number of temporary foreign workers, so these folks. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. The folks who are coming underneath this program, which is either uh, seasonal agricultural workers, live-in, low-skilled pilot, people through international arrangements, and so-called high-skilled workers, has actually surpassed the number of refugees that we are bringing in. So we're actually bringing more people to work in Canada without stat, well they have status, they have work permit status, 
but without full status, then we are bringing people who do have status. And with that temporary status comes less rights, comes less access to um, public resources, um, health care, public services, social housing, all kinds of those things. So all very important things to think about. Um, and so the last thing I'm just going to talk about is uh, the press release that happened today. Uh, so basically, um, did you show that video yeah. yet? Oh, you did show it. Okay. So you guys already went through all those things. <laughs> um, Max Scott, who is working um, with the End Immigration Detention Network, which is what I'm informally a part of at this point. It's all members from Forza Forza and No One Is Illegal. Um, we're working on Michael Mbogo's case, and he has filed a complaint with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. So we are hoping uh, that they are going to respond to this case, um, and that through this case, we will be able to set up a presumptive period. That's only one chisel in a very, very long road to try to end immigration detention and also rip apart the prison industrial complex. <laughs> but it is a chisel nonetheless. Mm -hmm. um, and so today was a big day, and especially a big day for Michael Mugogo, who's been in immigration detention for seven years. So that's all I got.